Michio, I want to know everything. Everybody wants to know everything. Um, physicists claim to be trying to find a theory of everything, a so-called grand unification theory that can bring all the forces and particles together. Is this quest a, a realistic one? I think so. If you were to summarize the progress of physics in one word, 2,000 years of physics since the time of the Greeks into just one word, that one word would be unification. Yeah. For example, Newton gave us a unified theory of the heavens. What makes an apple fall on the earth is the same as what makes the heavens move in outer space. If you were to summarize the work of the uh, 19th century physicists, it is that electricity and magnetism can be unified into something called light. And if you were to summarize 20th century physics in terms of particles, the, the word would be unification again of the nuclear forces with the electromagnetic force. Mm. So now we have these two great theories, uh, the theory of the quantum, the very small, and the theory of the very big, the theory of Einstein and black holes in the universe. The problem is these two theories don't unify. They hate each other. They are based on different mathematics, different physical principles, different assumptions. And I find it impossible to believe that nature could create a universe that is schizoid, <laughs> that has two mathematics, two physical principles, two assumptions governing the very small and the very big. Describe to me some of those fundamental differences in terms of the mathematics. Uh, the quantum mechanics is very probabilistic. For example, it deals with smears of things as opposed to discrete things. For example, relativity is based on smooth sheets of paper and, and, and trampoline nets. <laughs> smooth manifolds, as we call them, like surfaces. However, the quantum theory is full of tiny little quanta, uh, discrete packets of energy which chop up this space-time into little pieces. So these two theories are opposites. One theory is based on smooth surfaces, the other one's on chopped up particles. One theory based on probabilities, like a crapshoot. The other one based on certainties. So you see that they really are polar opposites in almost every single sense of the word. Yet how can nature unify them into a cosmic unity? Many of the giants of physics have tried. They have all failed because of mathematical inconsistency. Some would say that, well, why worry about it? Because quantum mechanics only deals with the very small and general relativity only with the total universe. And so they're to two totally different domains. But what happens in black holes or at the beginning of the universe when everything is very small at the beginning of the universe, you really have quantum mechanics and general relativity must work together at some point. So if it must work together at some point, we've got to deal with, 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 with how to harmonize them. That's exactly right. Stephen Hawking, for example, has tried to show that even black holes are actually gray because they ooze out quantum radiation according to the uncertainty principle. So you have to marry these two theories together. What happened before the Big Bang, for example? That question makes no sense in Einstein's theory. Einstein himself realized the defects of his own theory. Einstein's theory breaks down at the heart of a black hole and at the instant of creation itself. The so-called singularity. That's right. A singularity is a place of infinite gravity, which makes no sense. I think there is no such thing as infinite gravity. It's nothing but a way to hide our ignorance. And that ignorance is, is potentially not knowing this theory of everything, some grand unification, some way of bringing these quantum mechanics and, and general relativity together. So we need a new physical picture that okay. unites these two. And string theory can be explained to a child. For example, I have these vibrating strings which create notes. These notes are the particles we see in nature. Different frequencies are different, different particles and different forces. If a, an electron is a rubber band and I twang the rubber band in a different way, it turns into a neutrino. In fact, when I got my PhD from the University of California at Berkeley, I had to memorize the names of hundreds of god darn subatomic <laughs> particles. Today, I hope that when you get your PhD, you would simply say, string theory <laughs> and get your PhD without having to memorize all the names of these subatomic particles. Because all of them would be just uh, different ways that the string would vibrate. And when the string moves in space and time, it forces space and time to curl up exactly the way Einstein predicted. In other words, if Einstein was never born, 
If Einstein were never born, his entire theory would have been discovered as nothing but the first octave, just the first octave of string theory. Now, some criticize string theory as being unfalsifiable. There's no way you can say it's wrong, that it makes no predictions. There's a whole series of, of criticisms that are leveled at string theory, oftentimes without anything else to replace it, but nonetheless, just because uh, uh, nothing else is right doesn't make string theory correct. Yeah, I think these criticisms are silly. For example, we've never been to the sun, so how do we know the sun is made out of hydrogen? Well, we have sunlight. We analyze sunlight, and we have indirect proof that the sun is made out of hydrogen. No one's ever seen a black hole. In fact, black holes are invisible. <laughs> and yet we've discovered thousands of them in outer space because we look at the indirect clues sure. of the accretion disk. Sure. Physics is usually done indirectly. People forget that. People say you need an atom smasher the size of the galaxy to test string theory. That's silly. Because experiments are being done, for example, University of Colorado, looking for deviations from Isaac Newton's laws of gravity. You all know from elementary school that gravity diminishes the farther you are away from the star or the Earth. In fact, it diminishes the inverse square law. But that's because we live in three dimensions. In three dimensions, things diminish as the inverse square. Just like if I have a light bulb, uh, light from a light bulb diminishes as the inverse square. If the universe were four-dimensional, gravity would diminish much faster. It would diminish as the inverse cube, the inverse quartic, the inverse quintic. Therefore, by measuring gravity right on a tabletop, right on a scale of inches to millimeters, we might be able to show that there are higher dimensions that exist. Not to mention the fact that in outer space, we'll be putting up gravity wave detectors in the next decade that may pick up the shock wave from the instant of creation itself. That's why I bet $1,000, $1,000 on longbets.com that by 2020, somebody will win a Nobel Prize for some version of string theory. In which case, string theory will really have to have been confirmed experimentally, not just theoretically. And I think that our next generation of atom smashers, if they pick up particles, super particles predicted by string theory, or if our satellites in outer space pick up radiation from the pre-Big Bang era, that's going to change the entire physics landscape. A new paradigm shift will open up as people begin to realize that we can talk about pre-Big Bang physics. We can talk about physics that was once thought to be taboo, is now within the province of mainstream physics. So how important is this concept of a theory of everything? Some people would just sort of dismiss it as philosophy, but it, it really could be within our grasp to really understand the fundamental theory of how everything got put together. Well, some people say, what's in it for me? Am I going to get better color television from this? Am I going to get uh, more cable channels from your unified field theory? Well, the answer is no. We are talking about energy scales that are found only in stars and galaxies and throughout the universe. However, it could be the ultimate quest of 2,000 years of science. The ultimate quest set by the Greeks. What are things made of? What does it all mean? Perhaps this is the final culmination of a 2,000-year quest ever since the ancients asked that question. Now, of course, many roads have to be traversed before. I tend to look at it like you're in a desert and you're looking for artifacts and you stumble across a pebble. You push away the sand and you find that it's not a pebble at all. It's the top of a pyramid, a gigantic, huge pyramid. And as you excavate down the pyramid, you pick up strange writing, secret chambers and things. <laughs> and now finally you're at the bottom level, the door. You see the door and you're about to open up that door. That's where we are now in progress with string theory. We are about to open the door into the 11th dimension.